Good morning, friends. No, are you here? <laughs> we started a conversation about what this island is that you've been looking at on the screen. You tell me it's not your island. It might be my island. Catalina, California. So go ahead and warm up right now as I tell you about this little island right off the coast of Long Beach. We get on little, uh, a little passenger ship and it takes about an hour to get out to Catalina Island from the mainland. Not, I don't know the population and I haven't been on the island for a while. A lot of backpackers, a lot of hiking, a lot of wildlife, a lot of snakes. Um, so if we are, what, what are we here today, 12 degrees? What are we now? I think it's five degrees, but. <laughs> on Catalina Island on, in the summer, you know, it's in the 30s. It looks brown like this a lot of the time. It'll be green when the rain comes uh, in the winter, and then literally within a couple of weeks, once the sun turns on for the long spring and summer and fall, Catalina Island turns brown, the top of it like that. But it's a lovely relaxation place. A lot of tourists go there. The cruise ships stop there. Um, it's very warm today on Catalina Island. <laughs> so listen, yesterday, I showed you this image uh, from Stroop, Dr. Stroop, the psychologist. I'm going to put the first one up that we started with yesterday. And you remember the exercise, right? Because our brains are doing work. This is what camp is for. So don't be troubled in your heart. If you came to camp, that's because our brains, our hearts, our minds, our bodies are doing work. Now, I'm going to show you the second image that we were supposed to do yesterday. You're going to see a penguin, but you're going to see a word, camel, okay? Don't read. Look at the animal picture that you see and say the picture of the animal, all right? Here we go. One, two, three, go. You gave up. You're giving, oh. Oh, we have... There's no judgment if you're going slow. There's no judgment. It's hard, isn't it? The first prize goes to the 20-something teacher in the front row. The Stroop effect. What happens when the mind gets competing information? We think we know a thing, and we're confronted with something new, and our mind is trying to work it out, right? This is what camp is for. This is why I love these particular conversations. I think all morning at camp should simply be one long Bible study every morning. And we simply rehash the text of the day. That'd be brilliant. So 10 minutes this morning on yesterday, all right? This isn't today's topic. This is 10 minutes on yesterday. Can we do that? Because I had such rich conversation with so many of you. Here's a few of the things I heard. These are not all the things. And by the way, these, what, these comments were not the comments from people who were on the Ezra ship yesterday, who were right on. These were some of the troubled folks who were working on it. Number one, Ezra's a prophet, isn't he? Prophets don't make mistakes. What are you saying, Pastor Chris Oberg? Okay. Number two, as if Ezra is wrong, God would have corrected him. God corrects people in the Bible. Number three, the pagan women would really destroy God's nation. They had to leave. This was God taking care of God's tribe. Number four, there is no other way. This is God's plan. Listen, fasten your seatbelt. It's a rough ride. Number five, Ellen White says. Okay. Is Ezra a prophet? He's a scribe and a priest, for sure. There's a lot of chatter about his, his role, but he is for sure a, pride, a, a priest and a scribe. When they call for someone to get the scrolls, it's Ezra. So you know in the New Testament when Jesus does some chastising of the scribes and the priests and the Pharisees? All right. Maybe that's Ezra's station in life. If Ezra is wrong, God would correct him. Well, we can see lots of wrong things that happened in Scripture. Not everyone got corrected, did they? So maybe it could go both ways. Number three, the pagan women would destroy God's nation. Well, in fact, actually, I'm suggesting they weren't pagan. They weren't actually heathen as much as they were women of, other, uh, of, of um, neighboring lands. Okay, we don't actually know. There's no conversation. This is the biggest challenge in the Bible. We call it the argument from silence. Ah, oh, the storyteller doesn't tell us everything we want to know. 
I want to know the homes, the faith traditions all of these women came from. And by the way, all of the men came from. We don't know the answer to that. But there were an awful lot of people the nation of Israel accumulated along the way as they moved to the promised land. We know this. Rahab, this top of the list. That's a beautiful story. Go back and reread it because guess where she ends up? In the bloodline of Jesus. Number for there was no other way. This is God's plan. I think this is something we say when we are not sure what to do with dissonance in our text. And so I'm trying to teach myself after 20 years of scripture study that it's okay for me to say I don't completely understand this story. And there's some dissonance here and there's some tension here and some things are fuzzy in scripture. Number five, Ellen White says, Ellen White says the women had to go. What I long for, one of the most things, uh, longed for things in my Adventist community is that we could have Ellen White with us today. What would Ellen White tell us about these women 140 years later? What would she tell us after she had read all the additional books and the research that had been published? What would she say after she listened to the specialists and the social scientists and the archaeologists, right? Because we know she cared about all of these things. I'm going to take you to the next, uh, I think yesterday we forgot to read this text, Jeremiah 29. While uh, the nation of Israel, part of them are taken off to Babylon, a letter does arrive from the prophet Jeremiah, and this is the counsel they are given while they're slaves. The Lord of hosts says to the exiles from Jerusalem and Babylon, build houses and live in them while you're a slave in Babylon. Do this. Plant gardens and eat what they produce and take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage. Multiply. What does that mean? Have babies. Don't decrease. But see to the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray for Babylon's peace. There's a little more of the dissonance then in the Ezra story for me because if Jeremiah the prophet said, God has a word for you, make your families and build, did they bring enough men and women and brothers and cousins with them? And it, it's fuzzy, that instruction, but they did what the prophet Jeremiah said. Here's a few principles that are guiding me when I read the Ezra story. Number one, I'm reading scripture through the overarching theme, the love of God. I am persuaded that there is one theme that emerges above all else when we take seriously the Bible. That is the love of God. So now I have to come back to the Ezra story and attempt to read it through the love of God. Not only what was happening to these folks released from captivity in the 6th century BC. We know a whole lot more story since then. What do we know about the love of God? Number two, I'm trying to read scripture with all the light we have today. Ellen White would do so. So when I look to the left and I look to the right and the sociologists and the researchers and the archaeologists and the historians and the theologians and the specialists are telling us, friends, there is a way of the land in the 6th century BC You can't simply send women back to their father's homes where they came from when they've already been used up and produced children. You can't expect their home will take the babies that came from a foreign nation. You ought to expect they'll get sold into slavery or they will die. In other words, I want to know what it is the specialists predict would have happened to these women and children. Number three, what if the two men who spoke up were indeed the voice of God among them? Remember, this was not Ezra's idea. Some men came to Ezra and said, you better do this. What if the two men who protested were actually the Spirit of God, the voice of God, embedded in the community? Number five, why are we not compelled by God's compassion to raise these children and care for these women? Knowing what we know since Jesus joined our story in flesh and blood, knowing what we know about how Jesus cares for people, if I'm going to read this story now through the loving mercy of God, why would I not be compelled to care for these children? And number four, send the men away. The men did the offense, right? 
These were the Israelite men who committed the offense. Who's not being faithful to God in this story? Why not send the men away and care for the children that have brought, been brought into this trauma? These are some of the questions that I bring to the story myself when I study it. Finally, I want to share with you something that's um, pasted in the front of my Bible at home. I'm only going to give you an excerpt, but it comes from First uh, Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 19 to 21, Ellen White's counsel on how we read scripture. I find it some of the most clear counsel that exists anywhere. Just a, a couple of paragraphs. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it's not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Did you hear that? This is just stunning to me every time I read it again. Humans will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put God's self in words and logic and rhetoric on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not God's pen. So look at the different writers. It's not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts on the man's words or his expressions, but not on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, is imbued with thoughts. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. I think this is the riskiest thing God did. Allow humans to write God's story? Are you joking? I mean, I think Islam has this right. Why don't you just tell the story that, the, that, like the Quran, it just dropped from heaven. We have one version of it. It's, you know, recited. Uh, it's the scribe writes it down to the prophet. The prophet uh, has it written down. Don, deal. We know it's God's word. That's easy and tidy, isn't it? That God lets humans write God's story startles me. Thus, the utterance of the man are the word of God. Sharp contentions over the Bible have led to investigation and revealed the precious jewels of truth. Many tears have been shed, many prayers offered that the Lord would open the understanding to his word. Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 19 to 21, if you want to read 19 to 22, if you'd like to read the whole section. That's a compilation, you know, the Selected Messages. Ellen White first writes these words in 1886 in Europe. I reread these pages all the time. And it's why Adventist Christians make a difference between the inerrancy, uh, inerrant reading of Scripture, right? So she's very helpful to me. All right, I'm going to put a pin in that conversation. I'm going to remind you this is why we're at camp. And when you see me lingering here and wandering in your neighborhood by your tents, your tents blown over by the wind, <laughs> this is what we're here for, to talk and talk it over again. So, can we put a pin in this one for now? And was any of this helpful? Okay. I ask for your forgiveness when I don't speak clearly, because sometimes that happens too. So, 